So uh, hello everyone. Uh, we are starting right now. So welcome to the Ato Fridays. Uh, this season, we are going to have a shorter season because we are organizing also the Quantum Battles version 2023, which is not without its uh, difficulties, but still we are here for you. And uh, today's speaker is Professor James Cryan from Stanford Post Institute. And uh, we are happy to hear some uh, work he's, he is gonna talk about x-rays. And uh, he uh, is a staff scientist at Slack National Accelerator Laboratory and the head of AMO Sciences Department at LCLS. And he's a member of the Stanford Pulse Institute where he leads the Atosilicon Science Group. James research focus on studying electron dynamics on the Atosilicon time scale and developing tools to better probe this phenomenon. He's also the lead instrument scientist for the time result molecular and optical sciences TMO Hatch at the LCLS, a soft X-ray spectroscopy hatch which specializes in gas phase samples. He completed his undergraduate education at the Ohio State University and his PhD uh, was from Stanford University in 2012. And from 2012 to uh, 2014, James was a postdoctoral scholar in the Chemical Sciences Division at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And subsequently in 2015, he joined Slack as a staff scientist. And he won also several prizes, such as the Spicer Young Investigator Award for his thesis work at the LCLS. In 2020, he was elected a fellow to the American Physical Society. We're happy to have him here. It's very early in the US, so, uh, good morning, California. Uh, mm -hmm. Good afternoon, Europe. And I'm in South America right now, attending some family business. So that's why we have the red curtains. My my sister likes red, so uh, curtains are different today. Uh, so let's hope there is no thunderstorm, because if there is, then there may be some transients. So please be aware. And we are happy. We are happy to start. So, uh, James, the floor is yours. Uh, feel free uh, to take it. And we're looking forward to your talk. And we we'll want to know about atosecond electron dynamics with X-ray free electron lasers. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, and and excellent work with all of the acronyms we use here at Slack. Right. Uh, that was great. Slack speak. You got all of the acronyms and everything. You'll notice we'll we'll spend whole days, for those of you who have been to LCLS, we'll spend whole days just talking in letters, right, instead of actually saying any words. So, you know, we shorten everything down, makes it really tough, but great, great, great effort. <laughs> Thanks, Carla. So I've been watching these Out of Second Fridays uh, for a while, and I'm really excited to be here to participate. Um, as, as Carla said, I'm, uh, I'm at the Stanford Pulse Institute, but I also um, have a joint appointment at the Lynette Coherent Light Source here at SLAC, um, where I lead a, a, one of our science departments, and I, also, um, and I also lead one of our experimental hutches. So uh, I wanted to start first by kind of, because my talks, I usually try to cram a lot into them. I usually don't have as much time when I get to the end. So I like to put my acknowledgement slides up front so that you know all the people who were involved in doing this uh, uh, get the credit they deserve. Of course, uh, at, at Slack and at Pulse, we are doing a lot with Out of Second Science. The group of people that uh, I mainly work with and who are helpful, and you'll see most of their work presented here today. Uh, this group is led by myself and Agostino Marinelli, along with Phil Buxbaum, all of us at, at uh, Slack. We have a number of graduate students who you can see their pictures here. I'll present to you mostly work from them. And then we also have a number of postdocs and staff, uh, notably uh, Taryn Driver and Tichi Lee, who I'll highlight a lot of their uh, work. 
And then also we have some recent graduates and people who have moved on down here on the right side. I put them in gray, uh, you know, uh, to, to reference. They A lot of their work is displayed here, even though they've moved on to, to other things. And then, of course, uh, if you're familiar with these X-ray free electron laser experiments, usually these are done in very large collaborations. So I'll list uh, some of the collaborators at the end, but I just put the institutions that also we collaborate with over here on the side. So I wanted to just start, and I probably don't have to tell this group too much about this, but um, I wanted to start with kind of the problem statement that, that we're trying to solve in, in my group. And what we really want to look at is the coherent motion of electrons on attosecond timescales or on ultra fast time scales. And so uh, this, is, I think, is shown very nicely in this movie that's playing right now. This movie was uh, made by Gilbert Grell, who's a, a postdoc working with Fernando Martin's group, and we're, we've been doing this collaborative effort. But it shows very nicely this is what happens to this molecule called aminophenol um, uh, after you very quickly remove an electron. So impulsive removal of an electron initiates some charge density motion, and the, the blue represents a, a depletion of the charge density, the red represents an increase in the charge density. And so you can see after this very fast removal of an electron that there's this oscillation of charge around the molecule. And so our what we'd really like to do with our research is to track this evolution. Now, there's something that Gilbert had to do to make this simulation tractable, and that is freeze all of the nuclei in place. And of course, we know that that's not exactly how the world works, right? The nuclei, when we remove an electron and charge starts to move around, this will create new forces, and these new forces will cause the nuclei to move and will cause bonds to change. And this will, this will then, of course, feed back on what the electronic structure is doing. So there's a complex interplay between the nuclear motion and the electronic charge. And usually we think of the nuclear motion as what is we usually call that chemistry, and then we have the electronic parts. So we'd really like to understand this complex coupling between nuclear motion, coherent electronic phenomenon, and how these very fast uh, initial transients influence what we later think of as chemistry or uh, other important problems in chemistry, such as, say, charge transfer, which is important as we start to look at, say, photovoltaic devices. How does the initial kind of fast transients change what's going on in, in charge transfer? Now, this movie is really fun to watch, um, and you can just sit there and get mesmerized by it for a little while, but it's a little hard to understand exactly, uh, you know, what's going on. So Gilbert tried to help us by um, putting some, some boxes in the molecule and looking at what's the charge density like around different atoms. So this red line shows what the charge density is like in a small region around the oxygen atom. The blue line is around the nitrogen atom. And then the, the green line is kind of what's left over. So this shows you kind of the first thing that you want to know for this charge density is that First of all, it moves very fast, right? You can see the, the time scale here is on femtoseconds, right? So there's very fast transients that you have to track. And the other thing that you see is these motions of the electrons are really happening around different atomic sites. So if I look at the oxygen site, I can see a very different motion than I see at the nitrogen site. So this leads us to think of what tools we might want to have. And so this is where we want out of second soft X-ray pulses, right? Soft X-rays have atomic site specificity and they're spectroscopic observables. So if we can make an out of second uh, soft X-ray pulse, we can probe with the requisite time resolution and we can get the atomic site specificity to really see uh, this type of motion. Now, there's a little bit of a problem here. It's a technological problem. Here's a survey we did for a recent book chapter. Uh, this is looking at a survey of existing sources for soft x-rays, mostly based on high harmonic generation. And we see this kind of discouraging trend as we go to higher photon energies, the pulse energy goes down. And so, of course, this is only one way to, to represent a very complex situation of what a laser pulse is doing, right? I picked one metric of a laser pulse. It's pulse energy. You have lots of other ones you could look at, but this is a little bit discouraging. And if we want to start to get to doing some nonlinear interaction, say X-ray pump, X-ray probe, this actually has the opposite trend that as we go to, hard, as we go to uh, uh, deeper and deeper into the X-rays, the nonlinear, the cross sections for nonlinearities go down. So we need higher and higher intensities even. So this is a, a kind of uh, difficult trend um, to deal with. Fortunately, there's another uh, technology that one could use, and this is called an X-ray free electron laser. And in an X-ray free electron laser, we take an electron bunch and we accelerate it to relativistic speeds. So it's going very close to the speed of light. 
And then we pass it through a magnetic device called an undulator. And this magnetic device has alternating poles uh, between north and south, which cause electrons to wiggle. And as the electrons wiggle, they uh, emit radiation. They emit radiation at X-ray wavelengths. And so uh, if you have a nice enough electron Electron bunch and can get to high enough energies, you can actually, uh, uh, if, the, if the electron bunch is well conditioned, you can actually get this kind of back reaction where the electrons emit X-rays, these X-rays interact with the electron bunch, and you get this amplification of the X-ray pulse. Uh, this process is called a uh, uh, SASE or, or uh, stimulated or um, uh, well, it's called, I'll jump over that. It's called a uh, uh, sassy. You can see here a little cartoon uh, from uh, Zhirong's uh, review on this, uh, where we start with an initial electron bunch that eventually becomes micro bunched uh, as it goes through this undulator um, and emits the x-rays. Uh, so we have one of these. Uh, if you're interested, also, you can read more in this, uh, this seminal paper here on uh, x-ray free electron laser theory. We have one of these devices here at SLAC. We call it the LINAC Coherent Light Source. Um, it's actually undergoing a major upgrade. We were running with a 120 hertz copper accelerator. We are now uh, upgrading and, and commissioning right now our, our superconducting uh, accelerator. They can go up to megahertz repetition rate, so millions of pulses per second. Um, and so we're very excited about these upgrades that we're doing. This, uh, this device feeds uh, seven different uh, experimental hutches, uh, or actually eight now, eight different experimental hutches. Um, you can see here, we, we organize them into two different experimental halls, the near hall and the far hall. Um, as Carla said in the introduction, I actually lead the first uh, soft X-ray instrument that you come to on the, on the machine called TMO or the time-resolved uh, molecular and optical physics machine, or uh, HUTCH, where we can do uh, experiments. And so um, I'll tell you about what we've been doing with these free electron lasers. Now, one problem I should mention is, uh, if you go back to this paper, you can read about this. One of the main problems is that the FEL uh, comes from this process of a relativistic electron bunch, which is moving close to the speed of light, but not quite the speed of light. And you're trying to make a pulse, an X-ray pulse, that's moving at the speed of light. So as this pulse gets amplified, the X-rays and the laser begin to slip away from each other. Or sorry, the X-rays and the electrons begin to slip away from each other in time. And so the slippage of between the electrons and the X-ray pulse in a gain length, so the slippage in a gain length usually determines the pulse duration. Uh, this is a, a, time do way, a time domain way to explain uh, gain narrowing in a, in a laser. Um, but you're, we have typically been limited in the pulse durations we could make because of these gain lengths, because of this effect that you need several gain lengths. The gain lengths are kind of long, so you get a lot of slippage and you get longer pulses uh, as, you, as you go through the free electron laser. Uh, working with Ago's group here at Slack, we've developed a way uh, to make shorter X-ray pulses. And so this is actually comes down to decreasing the gain length. And we use a lot of tricks that, you know, we're doing things to the electron beam, but it's very similar to, to what you do in cell phase modulation in a laser pulse. We take uh, the electron bunch, which I show you the phase space right here. Uh, the energy is on the y-axis and the temporal profile is on the x-axis. So we have this moderate uh, spread in energy over in, in a rather unstructured bunch. We overlap this in a magnetic device with, a, with an external uh, infrared field. And so some of these electrons alternate in phase with the field and they gain energy. And some of the electrons alternate out of phase and they lose energy. So after the, the Wiggler device, you see that we get this kind of energy spread here, where we've now created a correlated energy spread or a chirp in the electron beam. We can pass this uh, chirped electron beam through a magnetic device uh, called a chicane, which is much like a prism compressor, if you're, if you're familiar with uh, these laser, a prism compressor and lasers, and it makes the the fast electrons slow down, the slow electrons speed up or take different path lengths so that they now overlap in time. And so we change this correlated uh, uh, time energy correlation into a very short electron bunch. And now we use this very short electron bunch and we pass it through our undulators to make very short X-ray pulses. And so you can see down here some of our single shot measurements, which I'll tell you how we do in a second, but you can see some of our single shot measurements of the X-ray pulse duration. We did at 900 EV and 600 EV. Now we can go back to this plot I showed you at the beginning. And now you can see here's what happens uh, uh, where we when we add our, our source to the, to the mix. 
So you can see our data points up here where we're able to get you know few to 10 microjoules of pulse energy. Uh, our pulses aren't quite as short as you get out of HHG, but uh, we're still able to get kind of these high energy pulses to get into driving nonlinear um, X-ray matter interactions, which is um, pretty exciting. And so what I'm going to tell you about with the rest of the time is how we can use this source uh, to do interesting science. So I have three different uh, uh, experiments that I want to tell you about. Um, the first is uh, using these out of second uh, pulses to probe electronic coherence in core excited states. Um, then I'll try to tell you about uh, our first our first endeavor into X-ray pump, X-ray probe experiments, trying to look at this movie that I showed you at the beginning made by Gilbert. Um, and then I'll finally end with kind of an outlook of some experiments we've done on nonlinear X-ray interactions to try to induce ultra fast charge motion. Okay. So uh, really quickly, I said I, I would explain this uh, when we get to it. How do we measure these short X-ray pulses? Well, one of the main workhorses in the experiments that I'm going to tell you about uh, is uh, called angular streaking, or sometimes called the Addo clock. Many of you are probably familiar with uh, streaking interactions. This is a, a two-color uh, ionization event. So I overlap an X-ray pulse with an infrared field. Um, in the presence of a, a molecular gas, say, and then I ionize the gas and I look at the uh, at the photoelectron momentum distribution, uh, depending on the relative phase between the X-ray pulse and the vector potential of the IR field, I get a change in the electron momentum distribution. That was a lot of words. I think pictures help. So here you can see some nice simulations that we did. This is for a 300 out of second X-ray pulse interacting with a circularly polarized uh, uh, infrared laser field and ionizing a 1s electron. This is just using hydrogen. Um, so for hydrogen, you're ionizing a 1s, which goes out into a p continuum. So in the absence of the laser field, you get this nice kind of dipole, outgoing dipole distribution. Now, when we add the vector potential, the, the of course, the X-ray pulse is very short compared to the vector potential. So the vector potential is rotating in time because it's circularly polarized. So when the vector potential points to the left at the time of ionization, we find that the electron momentum distribution is shifted to the left. And when the uh, vector potential points upward, the, the momentum points upward. So we see this very nice, uh, uh, you can kind of see now this idea of the auto second clock or the auto clock. Um, based on as time evolves, this momentum distribution rotates around the momentum, uh, around the, the, the momentum uh, uh, axes, right? So we get this rotation in time. Um, and so we get this correlation between time and angle, okay? And so it's nice that I can show you a simulation, but here's some data. Actually, this is single shot data we took with the X-ray free electron laser. This is looking at neon at 900 EV. So again, ionizing the 1S of neon. And now you can see we scan the phase between the X-rays and the infrared pulse. And now you see this uh, nice uh, uh, rotation of the momentum distribution in momentum space. The other thing we can do with the simulation is we can take the pulse duration and instead of using this very short 300 out of second pulse, we can start making the pulse duration longer. And you can see for the 600 out of second pulse, these lobes start to get wider. Uh, at 1.2 femtoseconds, they get even more distorted and you can see the trend. So the first thing that you can see is that we also encode information about the temporal profile of the X-ray pulse, right? As the X-ray pulse gets longer, these lobes get distorted. And so by analyzing these lobes, we're able to, uh, or by analyzing the momentum distribution, we're able to retrieve the X-ray pulse duration. And so here again, is just one frame of that movie I just showed you. On the left side is the, down here is the, the uh, momentum distribution of the, of the ionized electrons without the laser field. Then we add the laser field here to the right. And you can see when we add the laser field, two things happen. One, the electron momentum distribution shifts down into the right because that's the direction of the vector potential, but it also gets blurrier. These lobes get wider, encoding the temporal information about the X-ray pulse. And then on the right, uh, I show a, differ uh, a differential uh, map where we take the, the streaked electron distribution minus the unstreaked electron distribution. This is just to kind of help bring out the features, but you see, you can then very clearly see the streaking direction down into the right. And this is important, this last, this one on the right, because this is how I'll show you a lot of the, the data coming up. Okay, so the next thing we looked at is a molecular system. So we took our same overlapped X-ray pulse and infrared pulse 
and, and we put them into a molecular target. We use nitric oxide. Um, we tune the X-ray pulse to around 532 eV, very close to this, uh, oops, very close to this resonance feature um, in in uh, nitric oxide. And we actually here is the the vector or um, the electron momentum distribution uh, recorded in the absence of the X-ray field. So we see three different features. We can assign these features to different processes. This very high energy feature is due to what we call resonant Auger-Meitner decay. This is where we the X-ray pulse comes in and it takes a 1s electron from an oxygen atom and moves it into an unoccupied orbital. So it moves it into a valence state. So it's a resonant transition. This state then decays via the Auger-Meitner process where a high energy electron is ejected and another electron it fills this core level vacancy. Um, this creates the highest energy electron that we see around 520 eV. The other two features are due to the so-called normal Auger-Meitner process. This low energy feature just above 100 eV is from just one S ionization of a nitrogen atom. So the 500 eV electron or photon comes in and ionizes the nitrogen. Uh, one of the nitrogen 1s electrons. This then undergoes another Auger-Meitner process to produce a second high energy electron in the continuum. And that's the feature that you see here around, uh, around 300 eV or 350 eV. Okay, so we see all three of those processes. Now we can turn on our streaking field. Here you see just taking all of the directions. So I don't, I don't sort on direction. I just average over all of the directions of the streaking laser. And you can see this differential map shows you that there are electrons at higher momentum, meaning that we streaked them. And then the blue is showing what the, the spectrum looked like before the uh, with no uh, X-ray or with no IR field. OK, so now what happens when we sort them? Well, here you can see the on the left side, you can see the maps as a function of streaking direction. To try to take this movie and make it interpretable, we look at this small box that I show here in black, and we take this box and we plot the yield of electrons in this box as we change the streaking angle or as we change the phase of the IR pulse at the time of arrival. I call that the streaking angle. And so that's what you see plotted on the right side um, as we scan the angle. Now, as I was alluding to earlier, this kind of analogy to a clock, I can take this angle, the angle between the streaking direction and the box, and I can relate this to a time. So I can, I can follow this equation down here on the right, and I can say that I can take my angle, I can take the laser period, and I can turn this into a time. And so I label this axis, uh, this time axis on the top of the, the clock that I, I show you on the right side. So how do we understand this, uh, this uh, plot that I'm showing here on the right side? Well, we could go to a simple model. What would it look like if we just had this state that was decaying? Well, as, as many of you know, if you just have a single isolated resonant state coupled to a continuum, you would expect to see an exponential-like decay um, as, the, as the state couples to the continuum. Um, which is decidedly not what we see, right? We see a, 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 a spectrum over here that looks uh, very non-exponential non in its decay. And so to try to understand how the, you know, is this real or is this an artifact? We also, oops, we also scan the, the photon energy. So here you can see as we scan the photon energy from around this pi star resonance up to higher photon energies. And you can see that this feature right here, this bump kind of uh, decreases as we as we scan away from the resonance. So it has something to do with the resonance. Uh, I showed you this low uh, resolution feature at first, um, but if we actually go to a more high resolution spectroscopy uh, measurement, you actually see that there's not just one core excited state, but that's actually made that that resonant absorption feature is actually made up of three different uh, core excited states, all uh, all with the same electronic configuration, but different uh, uh, angular momentum interaction. So we actually have two stigma states and a delta state that make up this one resonance. And then the, you can also see plotted here with these overlaid Gaussians as we scan the photon energy, what the what's going on uh, with these resonances. And you can see that for this lowest one, we kind of I, we're we're kind of overlapping all of the resonances. And as we scan to higher photon energies, actually we see that we stop overlapping as many resonances. So this. This uh, fact that we're exciting coherently multiple states must be what's leading to this uh, non-exponential behavior. And so we can model this and we use a model where we take our three states, um, we put them, uh, we take three states, we couple them to a continuum that is dressed by the IR laser. 
And so you can see here, uh, this bottom curve or is showing you what we would expect for a single core excited state um, and the ionization rate. So the rate that electrons show up in the continuum versus time. Um, and we can see now if we add all three of these states together, we start to now see a beating. So we see that these states beat against each other and you get an oscillation in the ionization rate. You get a quantum beat. Uh, this is because the, the three states are excited coherently. We can also simulate the streaking interaction. So that's what I'm showing you up here on the left is just uh, a simulated streaking spectrum that we would get. We can take these simulated streaking traces and we can convert them to the observable that we look at and then compare to our data. And so that's what I'm showing you here. We uh, scan the photon energy in our model. And we overlap that with our data and we see that we're getting pretty nice agreement. Now you'll also notice that there's two sets of curves on here. What am I doing with these two sets of curves? Well, the the first curve, the dark curve, is what happens if we consider this a coherent uh, excitation. So if we're actually considering the coherence between the states. And the light curves, I'm actually removing the coherence. So we go into the density matrix, we zero the off diagonal elements in the density matrix, and we plot what those look like. We call that the incoherent mixture of the core whole states. And you see that clearly uh, this, this feature that we're seeing around three and a half femtoseconds is due to this coherent excitation of the X-ray pulse. And what this is, is we've created a coherent or we've created an electronic coherence or an electronic wave packet in these core excited states. And as this uh, angular momentum wave packet rotates in space, it emits the OJ electrons uh, with different rates. And so we're able to see that. So we've created an electronic wave packet and we're able to resolve them. So that's what we've done with electronic coherences in core excited states. Now I wanna to change to uh, talking about a pump probe experiment that we're working with. So using two X-ray pulses, X-ray pump, X-ray probe to actually go back and probe this paraaminophenol movie that I'm showing you at the beginning. So uh, the first thing that we need to do is we can make two X-ray pulses. This is, this is somewhat easy to do with our uh, accelerator uh, uh, group. Um, Agos group has been working very hard at this. So we can uh, take our two undulators and split them into two halves. So we have a first undulator to make a pump pulse and a second undulator to make a probe pulse. Uh, we have installed a magnetic chicane. So this will create a longer path length for electrons than for the photons. So we can delay the electron bunch relative to the X-rays. And then we can generate a second X-ray pulse and a second set of undulators. So this will give us two X-ray pulses. For technical reasons, uh, which I can explain if, if people have time at the end, we act it's actually advantageous to make this work in an omega to omega scheme so that the probe pulse is the second harmonic of the pump pulse. Um, and there's, there's technical reasons for that. Here you can see, we also did a streaking measurement of this and you can see the streaking pattern down here to the left um, where you see two photoelectron features and we can see the, the delay induced between them by looking at the angle difference in the, in the photoelectron streaking uh, measurements. We see this angle dis difference that tells us a delay. Um, now, we, we instead of using this uh, 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 velocity map imaging spectrometer that we use for the streaking, we switch to now using a magnetic bottle electron spectrometer. This is so we can, we can collect uh, electrons with better energy resolution, so we can get better energy resolutions. And now we switch to this uh, paraaminophenol molecule that I was talking about at the very beginning. Uh, here you can see what happens with just the pump pulse. So this is a 250 EV pulse ionizing the, the valence shell of, of uh, paraaminophenol. Uh, you see kind of two peaks in the spectrum. The first one is uh, looking at is from these outer valence states. And then around 35 to 40 EV binding energy, we get a second peak. These are intervalent states that are more 2S in character rather than 2P. Um, and, and we can observe both of these in the photoelectron spectrum. And then we add the probe pulse. And now you can kind of see the, the idea for our measurement scheme. Um, we, we have this pump pulse that removes an outer valence electron. Then with a time delayed probe pulse, we actually scan the photon energy and we try to find a resonance where we take a 1s electron from the oxygen site and put it into the valence hole that we've created with the pump uh, with the, the pump pulse. Here you can see on the right, the photoelectron spectrum as a function. So there's photon energy and uh, electron kinetic energy. You can see this is for the probe only, kind of showing you this resonance phenomenon for these very low photon energies. You see these photo lines due to just valence ionization. 
And then as we get up towards uh, 535 EV or so, uh, we start to see where we can take this oxygen 1s electron and put it into an unoccupied valence orbital. So these are, are these absorption features that I talked about before. We're recording the, the kinetic energy of the electrons. So these are these uh, resonant OJ Meitner electrons. And then eventually, as we scan up even higher, we get to the, the oxygen K edge and we can remove an, uh, an oxygen K edge electron and we can see the the um, uh, normal OJ Meitner spectrum from para aminophenol. But what we're going to do in this measurement is look for a new absorption channel that shows up at a lower photon energy uh, than, the, than the normal resonances, right? So we're creating a hole in a valence orbital that wasn't there in the neutral molecule. So we should see a resonant absorption feature at a lower photon energy, which I'll show in a second. Now, before I go into trying to show you the data, I need to take a step back and talk a little bit about how we have to do these experiments at a free electron laser. Of course, I was telling you about this, uh, this SASE process where these uh, we build up these electron pulses. They actually build up from noise, so these pulses can be somewhat noisy. I didn't show you this yet, but um, on the right side are some spectra that we get from just normal operation of an FEL. So these aren't the out of second pulses. This is just normal operation of the FEL, but this is the movie that I had when I was making this. You can see these these spectra are quite structured and uh, they have a they have a lot of things going on. There's several spikes and the spikes are changing every every uh, shot. And so typically we think of this as a disadvantage in doing absorption measurements. Typically when we think we want to do absorption measurements, we think about taking a nice narrow photo uh, photon uh, a nice narrow peak in photon energy and scanning it across our sample to try to see a resonance right uh, so that's what we think we want but actually I'm I'm going to try to show you how it's actually better to have this uh, this varying spectrum on the right as long as we can record what the spectrum is and correlate that with our data so how would we do this well there's a there's another field that has been doing this for a long time um, this is called, and it's typically called classical ghost imaging. So instead of doing this in the spectral domain, I'll explain this in the in the um, in the spatial domain. So what you usually have is a somewhat incoherent source. Uh, so you you could take your laser, you could pass it through some diffusing plate that randomizes the phase, so you get some random pattern um, to the to the mode. You take this uh, you take this beam and you split it. You put one side onto a high resolution camera. Um, so you can get, so you can very well resolve what the uh, uh, mode of the laser looks like. You take the other arm and you pass it through your object that you want to know what it looks like, and then you just record the total transmission through your object. You call that the bucket detector. Now you take both of these signals. You take the information on the mode. You take the information on the transmission through your sample, and you correlate those two with your computer. You put them both into your data stream, and you correlate the two. And it turns out you can get high-resolution reconstructions of the object that you're looking at. Um, and in fact, there can even be advantages that uh, these, uh, 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 if if your image is uh, is um, sparse enough, you can actually get. A, a, an advantage that you have to scan for less time to reconstruct your image than if you do this kind of uh, point by point scan uh, that what we usually call a raster scan. Now we can change this to, to more closely mimic our FEL. Instead of having, a, a, we have a partially spectrally coherent source in the FEL. We don't have an unknown object, we have an unknown spectrum, and then we have a spectrometer to measure that unknown spectrum. So we just change a couple of the words and now we're doing things in the spectral domain. Um, so how do we do this correlation? How do we solve this problem? Well, we can go up here and we can appeal to first order perturbation theory that the number of electrons or the, the, the number of excitations that we get uh, should be proportional to the integral of the cross section times the intensity of the incident X-ray field. So we should take the X-rays uh, and we should integrate that with the cross section and that will give us a total absorption, which actually turns into a total electron yield because after you absorb an X-ray photon, you emit an OJ electron and we collect these OJ electrons. So here you can see some, some of our characteristic data. The left side is showing you what the, what the um, electron kinetic energy spectrum looks like. And the middle pulse is showing you what the X-ray or what the um, 
what the uh, photon spectrum looks like, the spectrum of the X-rays. Now we can rewrite this integral equation in a, in a simpler form that maybe you would all recognize that we have some A, which is our X-ray spectrum. We multiply that by some unknown cross-section. The cross-section is what we're trying to get. So that's A times X. And this is equal to our yield of photoelectrons, B. So now you look at this equation and you can say, oh, I know how to solve this. I just have to solve for X. So the whole idea of getting back to this uh, uh, X-ray absorption spectrum is really just solving for X in this simple AX equals B spectrum. Okay. Now, uh, we, it, when you formulate the problem this way, there's several advantages. The first is it, it allows us to use something called regularization. Uh, regularization is just a fancy way of saying we can impose on the solution for X on our spectrum. We can impose some information that we think should be there uh, based on physics. So uh, often uh, assumptions we use are that absorption spectra are sparse. Uh, so there's a few peaks that make up an absor absorption spectrum. Absorption spectra are smooth, that there's not a sharp discontinuity, and that we're looking at absorption, so it's not negative. Uh, negative absorption, I guess, would be emission. So we're assuming that we only see absorption. So we use these very simple uh, constraints on our on our um, on our spectrum or on our our uh, absorption spectrum. And this actually helps us greatly eliminate noise. This can this can suppress noise quite quite well uh, in your reconstruction and or in your in your in your reconstruction. So you solve this ax minus b equation. So you minimize this ax minus b subject to these constraint equations that we call regularization. And so actually we've we've been doing this a lot for a lot of different FEL experiments. We actually have a Python package uh, that you could uh, download and use on any data sets you have. It's actually well set up. It's made by one of my students, June, who has been uh, working at this for a long time. And he uh, he's made a very nice package that if you have single shot spectra from any type of experiment and then an observable that you would like to look at, you can do this uh, reconstruction, this uh, uh, spectral domain ghost imaging reconstruction. In fact, he recently did it with the, the group of Benjamin Eric at a flash uh, uh, measurement. And he we did this really nice thing where we were able to show that we could do the uh, uh, the spectral reconstruction of the, with increased resolution at the same time that we can actually do a VMI inversion. So we took VMI data and we showed how we can do both, uh, both inversion problems at the same time. So we can go back to the full 3D momentum spectrum and remove the photon energy jitter in a single step, which was which was really cool. Um, and you can see that work on the archive. We're going a little bit further out there of how we can use nonlinear X-ray interactions to actually induce and probe charge motion. And so uh, I'll talk to you about this uh, idea that uh, has been talked about for a long time by the group of Shaw Mukamel called impulsive X-ray Raman scattering. This is an inelastic scattering process where uh, a mo molecular system absorbs an X-ray pulse at one energy. So you create this core level excitation, much like we were just talking about, a, a 1s electron is promoted to a, a, to a valence state. And then before this state can, can decay, so before the OJ Meitner emission, there's uh, the X-ray pulse stimulates emission of a different color and brings the uh, uh, electrons back down to the electronic state back down to a valence excitation. So we do this inelastic X-ray scattering process and we can excite any states that are within the bandwidth of the X-ray pulse. And so to kind of show this happening, Shaw had made this uh, movie. He and one of his students, Jason Biggs, had made this movie, uh, you know, almost 10 years ago. This is looking at a dimer, uh, a porphyrin dimer with a zinc sitter and a nickel center. Um, you can see up here the, 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 to the molecule. And they drive Raman at this nickel center and create an initial electron density that you see in the blue. And then as a function of time, you see that this begins to spread out across the molecule. Now, Dimer, but these porphyrin dimers are really hard to, to get together. Uh, they're really hard to get into the gas phase. They're, they're uh, a little bit hard to deal with. So instead of looking at this, uh, this zinc nickel porphyrin dimer, uh, we want to think, uh, you know, I, I put on my atomic physicist hat and I say, how can I, how can I make this easier? Well, I need two different atomic sites, um, the, it's one to drive Raman and maybe one to look at Raman. I need to stick them together. So why don't I just do this whole thing in a diatom? And so we go back to this uh, uh, nitric oxide example that I talked about at the beginning. I have an oxygen site coupled to a nitrogen site. 
I drive this with my X-ray pulse, and then I'm going to look for valence excitations that exist after the after the, the um, X-ray pulse has happened. Um, and I can I can see this. Uh, there, there's a re another reason to use nitric oxide. Of course, we already talked about this core, uh, this 1s resonance, this 1s to valence resonance that we can drive. The other thing is the uh, excited states of nitric oxide are very long lived. You can see nice vibrational spectrum, meaning that they don't dissociate. There's several non dissociative states. They just kind of hang around for a while as valence excited states. This lets us kind of this lets us come up with our probing mechanism. So what we're going to do is have our nitric oxide molecules uh, expose them to our ultra fast X-rays. And then come in a long time later with a UV pulse, a long time meaning picoseconds, or I think here we even waited a nanosecond, come in a nanosecond later with a UV pulse. This UV pulse has enough energy that could ionize valence excited states, but it can't ionize the ground state. So if there's any ground state molecules, it won't ionize them. But if there's any molecules in the excited state, it will ionize them to pr produce a, a nitric oxide ion. And so we can record these nitric oxide ions using a, a time of flight spectrometer, which is what we did here. Here you can see as we scan the X-ray pulse, the yield of nitric oxide. Um, this is without the laser. You can see the position of this uh, core excited resonance, and we scan uh, this, this uh, over a whole photon energy range. Then we add the laser pulse, and we actually do a differential measurement. So we take the, the UV laser pulse, and we put it late. So we, so we produce valence excited electrons, and then we ionize them. And we compare that to the case of when we have the UV pulse early. So the UV pulse does nothing, but the X-ray will create some, some uh, nitric oxide ions anyway. So we want to get rid of this background measurement. So I can plot this differential measurement as we scan the photon energy. So you can see the the blue, the red line is again just showing this absorption spectrum, and the blue line is showing our our measurement uh, uh, of our differential measurement of the excited states that we produce from the X-ray pulse. Clearly showing that we're able to produce valence excited states after the X-ray pulse. So the X-ray pulse comes through, and then we observe valence excited states. We worked with uh, Antonio Picon and and at the time his postdoc Lean Oberly to to understand this. They were able to model. Uh, this impulsive Ramana interaction. Um, and they did this as a function of, of X-ray intensity. And you can see here uh, the trend uh, with X-ray intensity of this uh, of this difference in NO plus. And we can see that we're actually able to drive this uh, Raman process and actually calibrate our intensity at the same time that we're getting somewhere around three times 10 to the 18 watts per centimeter squared. And on top of that, producing a coherent uh, uh, wave packet uh, and neutral uh, nitric oxide. Uh, we published this. If, if I didn't give you enough details, you can take a look at this uh, publication um, that we had in PRL. And with that, I'll, I'll summarize. So uh, what we've done is we've employed this uh, enhanced SASE technique, this compression of the electron bunch to produce broad bandwidth sub femtosecond pulses uh, from an X-ray free electron laser. We then used this to study uh, electronic coherence in molecular systems. We looked at this quantum beat or these core excited uh, state uh, superpositions. And then we've also looked at the uh, transients due to ultrafast ionization and paraaminophenol. Um, all of this was kind of enabled by exploiting the inherent jitter in an X-ray free electron laser to enhance our measurement resolution. I didn't talk about this too much, but we're actually able to get sub bandwidth resolution using this ghost imaging technique. So we can get even better resolution by, by doing this. Um, and we're also still in the process, and I showed you some first steps toward developing nonlinear uh, techniques to create and probe ultrafast charge motion. Uh, I'll show again, just here's the group, you know, I, I, I tried to highlight with their pictures a lot of the work that they were doing. Um, you know, much of this work is being pulled together by, by Taryn Driver, um, and a lot of the analysis of this paraminophenol work was done by Jordan O'Neill before he graduated and is being taken over by, by Eric. Um, Zhao Hang it works with uh, Ago very closely on developing these, these X-ray pulses, and um, he's been analyzing and, and simulating how the FEL is working to give us the two pulses so we can get very precise delay measurements. Um, there's also the AMOS department at LCLS. Uh, this is a lot of the group that does gas phase studies at LCLS and supports gas phase experiments. Um, 
The OJ Meitner streaking was a collaboration with uh, uh, several groups and the photo emission delays. This is a collaboration with with several groups. I I bolded the people who had major major uh, you know who really pushed through the last effort to kind of get the data analyzed. And then this paraaminophenol experiment is part of the so-called attosecond science campaign at LCLS. Um, and this is a, a multi-institution uh, uh, collaboration of, of, of groups working together for this. And the last thing I'll end with is if you think this FEL looks like a really great in tool for doing measurements that you're interested in, you're in luck. We have an open proposal call until the end of the month. Um, to do experiments starting in early uh, 2024, I believe, is when our next run will start. But the proposals are due in March um, that you can use this out of second mode to, to, to study, um, well, any process that you're interested to study. And so I put some of the parameters here. We both I was talking to you mostly about what we've been doing with soft X-rays. We also have a hard X-ray line where we can look at uh, diffractive imaging. Um, you're free to reach out to me. I put my email address on here, or we have various other department heads. If you say, you know, AMO Sciences just doesn't sound like me. I feel like more of a chemist, and I would prefer to talk to someone who has the word uh, chemical sciences department or material sciences department. So I put their emails as well. Thomas and Aperva are great people. They're happy to help you uh, talk about proposals and see how you might be able to do experiments at the at the LCLS. So I just wanted to end with that, and I guess I forget if there's time for questions. Well, it looks like there's some time for questions but hopefully <laughs> there are some there are some and i can see there are some raised hands uh, i'm very pleased uh to announce that we will have time for questions some people have been patient they are hanging in there and uh i would like also to make an announcement before i would like to say that um registration is open for Quantum Battles in Auto Science 2023. So if you would like to join, just uh, go there and register. We also have some uh, slots for contributed talks and uh, we're expecting it to be nice, fingers crossed. I see that there were two people asking questions, but they had to leave. Oh. So, uh, you know, Murphy's Law, and I apologize for that if you're watching on YouTube or anywhere, but uh, we need to be a bit strict here with the format sometimes. So are there questions, comments? And the other people are quiet. Uh, you know, it happens. So uh, let me start. Uh, you mentioned when you were looking at the auto clock as a way of doing measurements and, and, and assessing and characterizing your pulses that there were some distortions which occurred when your pulses got longer, mm -hmm. but you didn't elaborate on that. Oh. Would you tell us where they came from? Yes, yes, great. Uh, no, excellent question. I, I you know, I, I did jump over this pretty quickly. Um, but uh, what you can, I think what you're referring to is we go from, say, 600 out of seconds to 1.2 to 2.4, you start to see this other interference structure uh, happening. And this is because when I say down here that the x-ray pulse is 2.4 femtoseconds, that's the full width half maximum, right? That's not the full duration, right? And so this uh, this laser field has a period of 4.3 femtoseconds. So actually, the tails of the pulse are starting to stretch just as long as the laser period. So of course, you're very familiar with this, Carla. But what we're starting to see is basically multi-cycle interference. So electrons are released during two different uh, cycles of the IR field um, in different directions but they are mapped to the same final momentum because they come mm -hmm. at different times. So we're starting to see this multi-cycle interference effect or sideband formation, which is very similar to ATI peaks. But the, what we start to see is the appearance of these sidebands and they're spaced by the photon energy of the IR field. And it's really just the interference due to, to multiple cycles uh, of the IR field um, that, that we, we start to stretch longer than the IR field, which is a really interesting uh, you know, kind of quantum trajectory model to look at. 
for measuring X-ray pulse durations, it's a little bit harder, right? It's harder to interpret the multi-cycle uh, uh, dynamics at the same time as you want to know about the X-ray pulse duration. But it, so it's very interesting, say, quantum trajectories going on, but it's uh, a little bit harder for our pulse duration measurement. So we tend to stick to this kind of uh, the 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 left side over here where the pulses stay pretty short compared to the IR um, period and not not venture as much into this quantum interference. Although we do see some of these effects in the OJ Meitner lifetime. So as we're talking about uh, these core excited wave packets, we've actually done a subsequent experiment where we're looking at, we're trying to look for quantum beats between two different uh, non-equivalent carbon sites. So one of our students, June, is working on this. He's looking at a carbon with two hydrogens and a carbon with two fluorines, so CH2, CF2, uh, two non-equivalent carbon sites, and looking at quantum beats here. Here, the OJ lifetime starts to extend longer than the laser period. So we start to see some of this multi-cycle interference. It makes the pictures look really pretty, but also a little bit harder to understand. <laughs> Okay, other questions? I have one question. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, when you were talking about, I mean, it's kind of an obvious question because you opened already the floor for the question. When you were talking about the pump prof ex uh, experiments, mm -hmm. you mentioned that in the second modulator use uh, frequency two omega, mm -hmm. that, and maybe you, you can explain why uh, you use Absolutely. that. Absolutely. So uh, what we do to get to very short delays, right? I think I elaborated the, about this. I didn't I didn't go into this super a lot, but I, I think I mentioned the important points. So I'll try to hit on them again. So when you're going into this second undulator, you need to, uh, your your pump pulse is traveling at the speed of light, but your, your second pulse doesn't quite build up at the same speed. It builds up at the group velocity of the FEL in the, the second undulator. So that's moving a little bit slower than the speed of light. So what we need to do to make the shortest delays we can get to, to kind of get down to this 250 out of second regime, we actually need to seed the emission. So we take this electron bunch that uh, emits the omega pulse, and it now has a, already a micro bunch structure to it. When it goes into the second FEO, we actually reuse this micro bunching, but at a harmonic. So we don't work at the fundamental anymore. We work at the second harmonic. And this means that we can get away. We can make quite a bit of light using only one undulator section. So we only have to worry about the slippage between the electrons and the and the X-rays in one undulator section, which is around, depending on the wavelength, is somewhere between 200 and 300 out of seconds. Here, it was around 250 for the for the for the 530 EV. So this is this is a a, a temporary uh, uh, issue until we uh, fully make our we're building an X-ray delay line to fix this problem. But technically, for a little while, while we don't have this delay line, we have to work in this omega two omega scheme to get very close to zero. Um, we we can't get uh, if you if you want to use two non commensurate colors, you have to build up from noise in the second undulator, and that probably has a minimum delay of a few femtoseconds. So if you want to get below this kind of femtosecond barrier to look at the delays, which you see in the data here, uh, if I get to it, uh, you see in this delay, data, we actually have quite a, quite a bit going on in this first femtosecond that we wanted to probe. And so that's why we needed to go to this kind of omega to omega scheme. I hope that is helpful. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you. So are there more questions, uh, comments? I don't see any raised hands. Uh, we had two, but uh, they had to leave, unfortunately. Uh, that is life. I um, took too long. Yeah, yeah. I should have gone faster. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's always the call of the speaker. We know we, we allow uh, plenty of time and we take it on board that it's a Friday, you know. So, uh, anyway. Uh, I would like to emphasize as well that if you are a bit shy and would like to talk to the speaker, uh, we're going out of YouTube right now. So you can talk to him off record. And uh, this is a chance also that you could use. But I would also like to thank all of you who are watching online. Uh, it's important uh, to keep Ato Fridays healthy and going to come to the talks and uh, support our speakers. 
And uh, please be aware that some of the material may be removed when this is going to go on YouTube for good. So for those uh, watching uh, on YouTube, thank you so much. Uh, take good care of yourselves. If you would like to talk to our speaker uh, in a more private setting, hanging in there, you have the opportunity. So see you next time. We have a short season uh, this uh, spring, but also do check. There is a link uh, that I have posted, www.quantumbattles.com. Do check because registrations are open. We are taking invited talks. Uh, we are taking contributed talks as well. You can submit a clip. So it's not for being on site or online. We also will have contributed clips to YouTube if you would like to join. So everybody take good care of yourselves uh, and see you soon.